good day, people of Connecticut. I think this is everyone from Connecticut. Um, welcome to our day. My name is Kim. I'm the Children and Young Adult Consultant with the Connecticut State Library. Dear God, I hope you know that by now. And I'm here with my coworker, Ashley Sklar, who is a Community Engagement and Adult Services Consultant with the Connecticut State Library. I'll probably never say that right again. Um, and we, uh, I'm not going to say a whole lot, uh, before turning this over to our presenters for the day, who are from CERC, the State Education Resource Center, I just want to point out a few things to you. I'm going to, you know, make sure that folks are muted. Please liberally use the chat. Um, that way we know someone's awake. It's not me. I won't be in the chat. Um, but uh, please literally use a chat, converse amongst yourselves. Um, for anyone who needs it, the uh, transcriptions should be on. So if you toggle to sort of the bottom of your screen, you should be able to turn on the transcriptions. They're pretty good. They will always spell my name wrong, but I'm learning to live with that at this point. Um, we are recording this session. Um, it might take, you know, a day or two, but we will get the recording up on the uh, YouTube page and share the link out to everyone via the listservs, maybe a couple emails, I don't know. Um, Claire and Smita will also share the slides with us, so they're coming, they're coming, the slides are coming, we will have the slides. Um, and aside from that, I'm going to turn over um, this presentation on inclusive story times. I begged Claire and Smita to put this together, um, they didn't see me coming. Claire said a really amazing sentence, um, something along the lines of we shouldn't have to have like separate inclusive story times. Every story time should be accessible for everyone all the time. And then I just immediately opened my email and started crafting a message. And I think we were only halfway through the hour. Um, so that's sort of how this grew because she's Right. So, Claire, thank you for saying that amazing sentence. Ashley, thank you for typing, recording, and the only reason this is here. Smita, it was uh, it's a blast getting to know you during out this process. I'm going to turn this over to you guys. Um, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much, Kim. That was that was awesome. Um, all right. So everybody should be able to see my presentation right now. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> So welcome, we are the State Education Resource Center. Um, I'll introduce myself, I'll let my colleagues meet introduce herself. Um, I'm one of the consultants at the State Education Resource Center. I'm a dyslexia practitioner, I'm a Google certified trainer. Um, and in my previous life, I was a former uh, special education teacher. Happy to be with you guys this afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Smita Vora, and I'm also a consultant at CERC. Uh, I'm from India. I am an avid assistive technology user and a uh, visual learner. As you can make out from my voice, that I have a very, very heavy Indian accent and I also have cerebral palsy. So my speech might be slightly impaired at times when I, you know, when I speak too fast. So please feel free to unmute yourself and ask me again. I'm not going to be offended. I do this for a living, and I ask Kim, Ashley, and Claire to, de you know, to demonstrate this to our participants. Thank you very much for being here this afternoon. <clears throat> All right, and if you're just joining us, just as a reminder, we'll send out these slides afterwards. Um, probably within a day or two, they'll, they'll, um, Ashley and Kim will send it out. So we're going to show you a lot of links and other things today, so you don't have to scramble to write them down. They'll all be embedded within the slide. So our objectives for this afternoon, we're gonna talk, we're gonna do a, a brief overview, I would say, of Universal Design for Learning, which we'll refer to as UDL. Um, we're gonna talk about the science of reading, which is linked to UDL. Um, and we're gonna finally spend, we're gonna spend most of our time um, talking about assistive text strategies for inclusive story time, because that's why we are here today but we wanted to make sure you have the building blocks before we get into that. So when we talk about universal design for learning, how many of you have heard of the term UDL? If you can just raise your hand or put it in the chat, it would be really be grateful. I'm seeing a lot of people shaking their heads no, which is fine. That's why we're here to give an overview. Okay, so when you have a dinner party, I'm sure most of you have hosted dinner parties 
So you don't just make one dish for a dinner party, right? So UDL is like a dinner party. It's a menu. So you have a buffet. Because at a dinner party, you don't know if somebody's vegan, somebody's vegetarian, somebody's gluten-free, somebody's lactose intolerant. You have so many people coming to your dinner party and there are different likes and dislikes and different needs, right? So we have dinner parties where you always make a variety of things at a dinner party. Similarly, when you talk about universal death for learning, we're talking about variability. So in life, variability is a rule and not an exception. So when we think of inclusive story type, we just can't do story type in one way. We have to look, look at the variability of the clients who are coming to us. So they may be English language learners. They might not understand, might not be reading and read like might have disabilities, right? So how do you have that use for them where variability is the rule and not the exception? <coughs> and so there are barriers, right? Not knowing English is a barrier, but the barrier is not the meal plan. If I if I go to your come to go to Claire's house, they only cook non-veg food. And I'm a vegetarian, and the barrier is not me, it's the meal, it's, it's the meal plan. Similarly, the barrier is not the not the child who is coming to us, but, but the curriculum and the way we, we are designing the curriculum. And you always say, oh, that child, he's an English language learner, he will not be able to understand this. That child is reading below the, he's, he's, he's got dyslexia, he will not be able to read this. Right? So the barrier is not the person, but the way in which the environment is, the environment in which the curriculum is designed. <laughs> so when we talk about UDL, UDL is a framework. It's not a strategy, it's a framework to help, to provide options so that we can address the variability. I'm sure when you have clients coming to your libraries, they're so different, right? Nobody reads the same book. So we have to proactively think of the variability. We have to think, think of it beforehand, before we design anything. That's why the UDL, the framework for UDL, bring us to design it, you know, proactively to address the needs of the learner. So, you know, like if you have, some people wear a shoe, 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 a shoe size 8, some people wear a shoe size 10, right? We can, we can, we can design physical variables because we see it, right? You see, some people will wear, you know, some people are short, some people are short, are, are, are tall. So you have clothes for those because you can see that. But what is the variability that is here? You don't know. So how do you design for variability that you can't step here? That's in, in the kids' heads for whom you are who, from, for whom you are designing the, the story time. Right? So how can you see? So there's a shift from perspective. We are shifting from ability and surgery to variability. We don't say that child is disabled. We don't say that child has autism. We say that that, that child is in the variable learner. So there's a shift in language, a shift in, in perception, shift in our mindset. We're not, we're talking about variability, everybody is variable. So there's a different variability in background knowledge, how the kids come to us. Now, I really love this side, the ability depends on context. You see, when we talk about equality, everybody has got the same bicycle in the top row. The kid in the wheelchair, he can't ride the bike at all. The, the tall guy, he is slouching forward. 
and the kid, he's, he can sit on the seat of the bike. So when we talk about equity, we are giving people what they need. It's not about equity, it's about giving people what they need, right? So we have to give our, our patrons what they need. And we have to design our, we have to, we have to design our, you know, our, our services in a way that would meet the needs of our pay, patrons. So I really like this, this graphic, but this is a bit really depends on context. So on the origins of universal design for learning, architecture. Somebody using a ramp, somebody using a motor wheelchair, like he will never be able to enter this building. Right? So because the architecture, so the, the fault is not in me, but it's in the it's in the design of a building. Right? So when we talk about universal design for learning, we're talking about creating learning space from the beginning that is accessible to everybody. <laughs> so these are the three principles of, of UDL, engagement, representation, and expression. We're not going to go deep into this, but if any of you want to know more about it, Kim and Ashley have our email, you can contact us directly and we can talk to you a little bit more about this. So what the universal design for learning is, is that you have to be engaged to learn. If you're not engaged, then you're not going to learn. You will need representation in a variety of different things. Everybody can read. Some, somebody will need a pictorial book. And how can you show what you've learned? That is also in a variety of different ways. So, so the goal of universal design for learning is to, to have learned learners who are purposeful and motivated and who are goal directed. Right? So it is a it's a very broad principle. Universal design is not something that you can do in one day. It's a very, very broad overarching principle. Does anybody have any questions before we keep going? Yeah, another another good example. So um, <clears throat> think of a building that does have ramps. How many people do you see using those ramps to get in the building that don't use a mobility aid, such as a wheelchair, right? If you're pushing it, and I know, I know librarians push around a lot of heavy carts of books. I know you'd prefer to get into that building. You know, if you've, if you've got a cart, you're, you're doing that um, up the ramp. You're not going to try and lug that up the stairs. That's ridiculous. If you're pushing a stroller with kids, same thing. So the, uh, the point of universal design for learning, which comes from architecture, is that those who need those accommodations will use them. Those that find it faster or easier to do it their own way will do so. But the point is, is that the option is there for everybody. And it's there from the beginning. It's not mm -hmm. retrofitted out. out of it. The most retrofitted building that I've gone to, I've go, gone to the back of the building, by the kitchen, by the dumpster, I've entered the building. But they didn't have a ramp in the front of the building. So I'm an adult, but can you think of what that would do for a child who has to go to school every day like that? It would re really minimize the child's confidence, right? Child feels that the school doesn't value me. So we, ha we have to start from designing for the broadest range of people. <clears throat> So again, there are 29 checkpoints and what we don't expect anyone to do, this includes educators, librarians, anybody, we don't expect anyone to go through this entire checkpoint and make sure that they're meeting all 29 checkpoints anytime they do a story time or a lesson plan. That's not realistic and it doesn't make sense in most contexts. What we do want to do is we wanted to provide this checklist so you could kind of better understand the reasoning behind, um, for example, why we would activate or supply background knowledge before we start to read a book. That's just an example. So as we said, there are three three uh, guidelines, the why of learning, the what of learning, and the how of learning, right? Because often kids ask you, why do I need to learn? 
calculus. Right? Or why do I need to read this book? That, that's something that, that the, some parents will ask their kids to read a book and the, the, the library, why do I need, need to read this book? To set priority. The word of learning is uh, how are you representing learning? There are audio books, right? The so audio books are really good. People, some people who can't read, they can still enjoy literature. And the how of learning, how are you going to demonstrate your knowledge? Earlier, uh, you said know, people in pencil, and that was only one way of demonstrating knowledge. But now we've got computers, we've got the flexibility that kids can represent their knowledge in a variety of different ways. And this is a very, very brief overview of UDL. So the key ideas are your goal should be really tight. But how you achieve that goal may be very flexible. For example, there's a goal to get fit, right? If there's only one way to, to get fit, it is by exercising. And a lot of people will not do that. There are many different ways of getting fit. You can walk, you can bike, you can run, you can do yoga. So it's the, the, the flexibility in the means of how you achieve your goal. Variability is the norm. We have to accept that variability is the norm. And context matters. So how you are, what is the context of the learning? Why, why do you choose a book? The, and some accommodations that are good for some, that are essential for some, may be good for all. For example, if you have squishy balls for kids with autism in your library, then they can attend. And then some kids who, other kids might also use it, that might be having to attend story time even better. So these are the key ideas. You have to remember, UDL is not a checklist. Or well, I've checked this in Shibuya, it's a checklist. And it's very small changes. Sometimes the changes are so, so small that administrators do, may not be able to recognize them. And it varies in different contexts. So UDL in my class might look very different from what it would look like, like in Claire's classroom. Mm -hmm. Do you have any questions? Oh, I'm sorry, so go ahead. Sir. Do you have any questions so far? Well, we have gone through a whole one day of UDL in 20 minutes. We really try to provide a very, very brief overview of what UDL is and how it relates to what the work that you all do. So please put in the chat a Raise your hand and unmute yourself to ask us any questions that you may have. I'll wait a minute before I keep going to see if anybody's typing. Ashley, Kim, do we have any questions? Any comments that you would like us to answer? We don't have anything yet. We just had, you know, a couple of, of folks sort of chatting about, um, you know, services and, and sort of mm -hmm. the images that you've been using, but not yet. Sometimes for longer questions, people do need a little bit of time to chat, sure. but this isn't the world's largest group. So if anyone has a question, as I know sometimes it can be hard to like type if there's a scenario you're thinking of. Um, at the bottom of your screen, I think, I think if you click reactions, there's a raise hand button. We will um, see the people who use that. We'll, it'll kind of get bumped up to the top. So if anyone at any point has a question that they're not entirely sure how to type into words, I'm definitely that person. Feel free to hit the raise hand button. Um, we'll turn our, our attention over to you to allow you to to ask a question, but so far this is great. And I'm, I'm about to like text Ashley and be like, when can we squeeze in a session just on universal design learning? Cause I feel like it can help for all of us, whether we're doing story times or not. Well, I was gonna say Smita and I actually will do a whole four day presentation, like a full four day presentation on it with schools. And so we definitely, you know, took you guys through a lot in a very short amount of time. Well, we'll message you later for that one. <laughs> Ashley gave the thumbs up. We're both in agreement. It's coming if anyone's wondering. Sounds good. 
All right, so that was one building block we wanted you all to have. And the next one we wanted you to have is the science of reading. And I wanted, I'm just gonna read this definition out loud for you. Um, this comes from the defining guide of the Reading League. Um, there is a branch that uh, recently opened in Connecticut last year. Um, I'm very proud to be on the committee for that. Um, they were formerly called the Dyslexia Society, but they moved to the title of the Reading League because they understood that what is, um, ascent, and again, just like with UDL, what is essential for students with dyslexia is really beneficial for all kids. So the science of reading is a very vast interdisciplinary body of scientifically based research about reading and issues related to reading and writing. This research has been conducted over the last five decades across the world. It is derived from thousands of studies conducted in multiple languages. The science of reading has culminated in a preponderance of evidence to inform how proficient reading and writing develop, why some have difficulty, and how we can most effectively assess and teach and therefore improve student outcomes through the prevention of and intervention for reading disabilities. So they do publish a free defining guide that can be downloaded off their website. I will make sure that that link is included when I send these slide decks over to um, Ashley and Kim. So when I say the science of reading, I'm referring to an entire body of research. Just want to clarify as well what science of reading is not. It's not an ideology or philosophy. It's definitely not a one-size-fits-all approach. There's no one program or curriculum that I could point to and say this is the science of reading and only this. And it's definitely not a single specific component of instruction such as phonics. It, enc it encompasses all of the um, essential components of reading. So this aligns very well with the unique uh, kind of representation, expression, and engagement, right? Because it's not one size fits all. Exactly, exactly. So this is just a little handy graphic um, mm -hmm. reading in the brain. So just to be really clear, because I think sometimes there's some confusion about this. Reading is not a natural, oops, I'm sorry. Reading is not a natural process. It doesn't happen naturally in our brains. Um, neural connections for reading don't exist until we in explicitly instruct in reading. So we don't, so you're, you know, the child that's sitting in your lap may absolutely love re being read to, may love um, reading, and that's wonderful, and I would never discourage that, but they will not naturally learn to read just by having books in front of them. The simple view of reading that you see below here has been validated by over 150 um, plus scientific studies and continues to be validated to this day. It originally came in 1986, um, but there have been um, a couple hundred studies that have validated it. So um, and it's, a, it's a very simple formula, if you will, decoding and word recognition, which is transforming print into spoken language. Um, it requires language comprehension, so under, us understanding spoken language, and then it, it results in reading comprehension or skilled reading. And this is a visual metaphor. I won't go into this too much, but it just um, this is called the reading rope or the reading braid. You'll see you'll see both used pretty equally. And these are all the different components that go into reading until we get to skilled reading. Um, we're going to focus a lot more on the language comprehension piece today because that I felt was something that was more crucial for librarians to um, to work with. In, in case in case you're wondering how I vetted this, my mom is a librarian too, so I, I made her go through this presentation with me and she, um, and we talked about, you know, what would be most appropriate for, um, for librarians that are doing uh, story time with kids. She was a librarian at my school, which is why I couldn't get away with anything and I had to be the teacher's pet, but anyway, <laughs> she doesn't work there anymore. Um, so just so you guys know, this is the Connecticut State's definition, working definition of dyslexia. Um, we are actually in the process of revising all of our guiding documents with dyslexia, but this will hold. Um, it was also, um, it's also uh, very, very closely matches the federal definition as well. I'm not gonna read the entire thing, but it is um, considered a specific learning disability. Um, it impacts reading, specifically decoding an accurate and or fluid fluent, sorry, word recognition and spelling. And the important thing that I really like to point out here is that it's neurobiological in origin. So it doesn't matter whether a child has never been read to or has always been read to. Dyslexia is something that we are born with and it comes from the brain. So it doesn't, it, do, it doesn't really, you know, again, you could be, there are lots and lots of kids that get read to every single night that absolutely love reading and it doesn't make them any less dyslexic. Um, our dyslexic students typically have average to above average intelligence. 
Um, I've known a lot of dyslexic kids in my day who are a lot smarter than I am, who have excellent visual spatial skills. They tend to be really good in those areas. They tend to be really great in, in the arts and in, in, in engineering and things like that. Um, there's a lot of really amazing um, famous dyslexic people. So um, it's definitely it's definitely not something that um, that can hin that that hinders one's intelligence. And these are just some essential clarifications. I won't go through all of these. Um, again, a limited English proficiency is not something that causes dyslexia. Um, you student may have both limited English proficiency and dyslexia, but one does not um, cause the other. It may be more difficult for a child to learn a second language if they are dyslexic, but um, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, a student who is, is, is limited English proficiency is also going to be dyslexic. However, the important thing to understand here is that the instruction that helps kids with dyslexia also really, really helps kids who are English learners. Um, before we go into the meatier part of our presentation, I just wanted to see if anybody has any questions about dyslexia and how, or how we learn to read in general. I have a question and um, I'm not, again, this is one where I'm like, how do I even ask this? So when I'm thinking about in the concept of story time, are there changes or um, because in theory, like the librarian is reading the story or even the caretaker, because a lot of times, because sort of unlike the school structure in public libraries, at least we talk a lot with caretakers as well, who can ask questions and sort of notice things are, um, would there be any changes that would need to happen just sort of in the, in the verbal telling of the story um, with a child who's dyslexic? Or is that just for um, working with that child while they're reading the words themselves on the page? Does that make sense? That's a perfect that's example of yeah, questions. Y'all can question. unmute yourselves for. Okay. No, that's a great question. Um, typically, a student with dyslexia still has average to above average listening comprehension. So they would be able, so we don't, tip, we don't typically see kids who are having trouble following along or understanding a story if they have dyslexia. However, we are gonna go over some strategies to help boost comprehension for students. Um, I think something that is really important, and we'll talk more about this as we go, with a child who is dyslexic, um, pairing audio texts with visual texts can be extremely helpful because it allows for repeated readings of the text. Um, and I know, I know a lot of you probably use audiobooks in your day-to-day -day life too, maybe in your commute or just while you're washing the dishes or something. I don't know. Um, so we'll talk a lot about that as well, but that's a great question, Kim. Thank you. Thank you. I see somebody raised their yep, hand. Yep, we have one more. Chrissy, go ahead. You should be able to unmute. Okay, cool. Hi. Um, so I have kind of a an oddly specific question, maybe not so odd, but um, I am actually tutoring some older kids right now in, in reading, and obviously I'm not an expert in dyslexia or any kind of reading troubles or anything at all, but I guess my question was if I suspected that one of them or both of them might have dyslexia, like what mm -hmm. kind of resources would I be able to connect the parents with to try to maybe get them evaluated or just any sort of help like that? That's a great question. I'm assuming these kids are in, are in public school. Um, so their parent doesn't want to tell me what school they go to, so I actually don't okay. know. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah. Um, that's fine. So what typically needs to happen is that um, the, the, the district or school, whichever, you know, even if it's a private school, the school should be, taking, um, should be taking data on these kids and should be seeing whether they're performing at grade level. And if they're not, um, they should be put into what's called the SRBI process, which is our scientific research-based intervention. Um, that's essentially a tiered intervention um, process that happens in every public school in, in the United States. And um, as, a, as an educator, I would want to be seeing the school start to do some screening and start to see what's going on. What are they seeing? What are they not seeing? So for example, a student with dyslexia um, obviously would have difficulty with reading. Um, more specifically, they would also have difficulty with um, something called phonological processing and phonological awareness, which is our ability to manipulate sounds um, and our ability to understand the sounds that make up our language. By the way, we have 44 of them in English that make up all of our words. 
Um, so I would first have her go to the school or district that she's working with and express her concerns there, um, especially, and I, and I will just say this for anyone, it, especially if the child is older and they're still not making enough progress and they're not close enough to grade level, I'd be more concerned because the earlier, as with many things, the earlier the intervention, the better. And the later the intervention, the more crucial it is to get something that's intensive and, and frequent um, for the child. So I would definitely encourage her, for her to be going to um, the school directly with her concerns. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And um, a, I know Ashley and Kim will share our emails. So Chrissy, if you want to talk more about that at some point, you can shoot me an email and let me know. All right. So we're gonna go into assistive text strategies. Um, if you want to, it might be helpful to open up another browser tab because we're gonna be encouraging you to play along with us if you like um, with some of these things. Um, and Smeet and I are also available if you have, um, you know, something that you really wanna play around more with and you want to um, set up an appointment to meet with us over Zoom, we'd be thrilled to do that. So just keep that in mind as we go through here. So the first one we're going to show you guys, um, this is a free program. It's called Described and Captioned Media Program, DCMP. Has, has anybody heard of this DCMP, Described and Captioned Media Program? And you'll notice at the top, this is actually a clickable link. So again, when you get these slides, you'll have this link. So I'm gonna actually open it up and show it to you. So it's, it's completely free. It's from the federal government. And once Claire logs in, she can show you some of the features. Mm -hmm. So the point of VCMP is um, it takes media, and I'm, there's just thousands and thousands of different lessons here. It takes media and it both um, captions them and title and, and provides subtitles. So not only does it say, you know, the words that are happening or, or narr being narrated in the video, it will also describe it for the student. So that's okay. very good for somebody with a visual impairment, right? Because they can't see. So it's going to describe what's happening. So, so you see, oh, there's written C and D. So it's also closed caption and described. I want to make sure my sh sound is shared. So the way that I got a membership was um, you do need to apply for membership and you just need to describe how you work with um, your patrons that might be um, learning disabled, might be hard of hearing, might be visually impaired and you will get a membership that way, but it is free. Okay, so you'll see this one here. I'm just gonna play it for a second. They're the best and brightest. I essentially created a device. It detects toxins, metal toxins specifically. The problem solvers of our future. So these are highly engaging videos. Um, they're, they cover pretty much any topic you could think of. Um, you'll notice on the side, it talks about what the um, episode highlights. You can create clips or lessons with them. Sometimes they're in series. It'll tell you what, um, what's the topic, what's the subtopic, what's the grade interest level. It'll give you some related media. And then um, you'll also see down here, language and accessibility. So I can turn on the captions or I can turn on the described English this way. I can go into cinema mode if I want it to be a little you know, nicer. There's a transcript here as well, which could be read aloud to the child. So there's a lot of different ways that they can, this can be made more accessible. Um, many of these videos, this one doesn't seem to, but many of these videos come in multiple languages as well. Or you could take that transcript, drop it into Google Translate, and um, translate it that way into the student's um, native language. Okay, so that's dcmp.org. They've got Maria's from pre-K up to grade 12. Right, so they've got materials for all ages. And you might have to browse through this website to learn more about it, but it's a really, really good resource. Um, I have a quick question, um, Go ahead, Clarence Nita. Is this the type of resource, so you said that you can get an account if you work with students who might have different types of um, differing abilities. Is this the type of site that um, a child and their caretaker can sign up for themselves or does it have to kind of be filtered no, through an institution? No, no, no a child and a caretaker can sign up to, even you can sign up as a librarian. Okay, awesome, thank you so much. I think yeah, I think they, yeah, they, I, I don't even know why, but they, they do ask, you know, like, what's your role, I guess, in working with, with people who, who have these needs. And so I told them, I said, I'm not a teacher, I'm a consultant, but I work with, and they, you know, they approved it immediately. So 
I think it's just for them to keep data because they are federally funded. Oh, that, there it is. As <laughs> someone who's also federally funded, we get it. Thanks, guys. I um, I feel like this is probably a good resource for uh, some some of the ways you know that we we at the state share out to to libraries and people. Absolutely. So I feel like you know, obviously, there's shorter clips, there's longer clips. I feel this could be a really great way to help build um, background knowledge. So let's say, for example next week you've got somebody from the Connecticut Science Center coming and they're going to bring um you know a, a unit on physics you find some videos on physics you post them on your library website and you say hey here's some things to get you prepared for next week and get excited about next week and we'll see you then and you know there could be so many different ways they use these all right so that's DCMP um and then the learning center is linked there as well and that's part of their um Part of part of their website as well. Oh, we did a fancy transition there. I didn't realize. <laughs> Bookshare. How many of you have heard of Bookshare? Bookshare is a free, federally funded, uh, federally funded service that for students with disabilities. So, if a student has dyslexia, a physical disability can't turn the pages or an organic disability, which is very vague, right? So the student can't read print, the student can have access to books. But it has to be through the school because you, you need somebody to say that the student has a reading disability. It can be a teacher, it can be a parent, it can be anybody. A reading specialist is just have to say that the student has got a reading disability and student can have an account for Bookshare. Bookshare is, they also have an app for it. So you can, it reads and you can follow along when it reads. They've got, I don't know, they've got thousands of books on it. Millions, yeah. There's over yeah. a million books, million titles here. Yeah. Um, and so, it, and also um, a clinician can verify the student's disabilities. So you'll notice here people with dyslexia, blindness, cerebral palsy, and other reading barriers. So if somebody, um, cerebral palsy would fall under this, but if someone cannot hold their head to read a print book, um, cannot track their eyes to read a print book, for example, that would be another um, example there. So oh, can um, I turn the pages to read a yeah, book? Yeah, or can't turn the page, those kind of things. Um, and other reading, because there's more than one reading disability. It's not just dyslexia, which is it's just the most common one. So um, we, we like to keep Bookshare in the awareness area of librarians because a lot of kids use this at school. And so then they could be also logging in to read um, when they come to the library as well. So let's talk about students' autism. I've often been asked, does students' autism qualify for Bookshare? Ordinarily, just the title of autism not qualify. But if a student autism has through reading disability, then the student would qualify. A student with emotional disturbance ordinarily would not qualify. But if a student has reading disability and emotional disturbance and the student can't concentrate on reading, then the student would qualify. So there's some wriggle room and you go if you can't go through the front door, go through the back door. Mm -hmm. So that's why um, it's important to, before before we, <coughs> parents want to apply for this or the teachers want to apply for this, they do want to check out the qualifications first and see. Um, but educators should know, very, pu as public school educators especially, should be very aware of this service. Um, and they are the ones that can help nav help parents navigate to see if their child is eligible. And then, so we just had a number of resources for digital trade books. All these icons are clickable. Um, some of you guys, I know, I know you know what OverDrive is. <laughs> like I, I, I was telling Samina the other day, I'm so bummed because I realized my library card expired while the pandemic has been happening, and I and I keep forget they wouldn't let me email a copy of my driver's license, so I had to like go, you know, it's this whole thing. Um, <laughs> I know it was like fun, you guys, but um, a lot of these are actually free. Project Gutenberg is free, right? Um, and then these other ones here, you can see there are some costs associated with it, but um, these are just some other examples of uh, ways to access digital trade books for kids. And you could put these up, you know, on if you have a projector in your library, you could put those up there and use that for, um, uh, for story time if you wanted to.
or if you have iPads or Chromebooks, those would also be a good way for kids to access books. All right, here's some more. We've got Google, we got Kindle. This one's called manybooks.net. A lot of them are free, some of them are not, but just again, some other options for you that you might not have been aware of. Oh yeah, and Hoopla. I, I should have put Hoopla on here. I use Hoopla all the time. Yeah. I, both. I will, you know what? I'll make sure to add that before I send the slide deck out. So Learning Ally is audiobooks. How many of you have heard of Learning Ally? No. So Learning Ally is audiobook and it's $115 per year per student. It's a bit expensive, but it's audiobooks, right? So they can listen to the book and, and this is in human voice. So, so, you know, it, it's got the intonation and everything correct. Whereas Bookshare is in a robotic digital voice. So we, some people have used learning ally in a variety of different ways, right? If you, if you don't have a reading disability, then you use learning ally to, ac to, to accelerate re reading comprehension. We had a school that came to us once and told us all our kids have, because they were in AP performance school, so they had all the kids on learning allies so that they comprehend faster and not spend so much time decoding. Right, because one thing that we talk about, especially with kiddos with dyslexia or any child that's still learning to read, um, is we want to make sure that they still have access to high interest books even if they're not able to independently read the book yet, and I like, and I like the word yet because that's important, um, they still deserve to have access to high quality, rich and engaging text. Um, and so I think it's really, really important that we, so if, if, for example, if you're doing a story time book, if you can find an audio version of it as well, the kids can do repeated readings at home where they can listen to the book before or after you've already read it to them. Um, and I think that's such a nice way to continue to experience the story. Um, one of the things that we talk about in some of our sessions is that really rich oral tradition that many, many cultures around the world have of storytelling, right? Oral storytelling. Um, you know, there's thousands of cultures that, that don't have stories written down on paper, but they have that, that oral storytelling, storytelling tradition. And so I think that audiobooks really um, deserve that, that high respect, really, of, of, um, of providing a way for us to share our stories in our culture. So we listed um, a number of iPad interactive apps. I will also put a plug in for our CERC library. Um, we have a number of, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, but we have a number of iPads that are available for loan. Anybody living or working in the state of Connecticut can have a membership to the CERC library. We're located in Middletown. Um, we're open by appointment. So you would just go online and um, you can do your browsing and then you can make an appointment to go pick up your items. We're, we're not available for in-person browsing right now but our librarian team is really fabulous and they will help you find whatever you need. Um, so if there was an iPad app um, that we show you that you wanna experience for yourself, I would highly recommend contacting our team so that you can um, take an iPad out to um, play with it. So these are just some of the interactive apps that might be good for little kids um, that they can experience the stories. Okay. Have any of you used those apps? You have. Okay. I'm just gonna. I was just gonna say I used to use them at a library. Do you have the penguin one? The don't let the penguin drive the bus, where the kids can talk at it. That mm -hmm. was my personal favorite because I'll the kids can fill list. in. Yes, the kids can fill in the story, so it'll come to a blank, and then they get to like put up the noun or the verb, and then at the end oh. it reads the story. And sometimes it'll use like the kids' voices if they're shouting at it. Um, my group of kids absolutely loved iPad time and the story is different every time because the kids are putting up the, um, the words. So we don't have, at least I don't have the penguin app on my iPad, but I'm oh, going to put it on my list. Have have to... Or pigeon. Don't let, like, don't, like, Mo Willems, like, don't oh, let the pigeon, pigeon drive the bus. Said, no, I definitely might have said penguin. I, <laughs> I, I, I did I, Chrissy? I'm 
I'm barely in between the rain. I need some more coffee. I don't know. I'm settling okay. off day. Pigeon. Don't let the pigeon drive. So we don't have Nothing. the pigeon one, but I, I'm I'm adding it to the list right now to investigate. Um, because that sounds like a lot of fun. And I, I know my so niece. Cute. Um, so the book creator is the next big tool that we want to show you guys. Um, book creator is free for up to 40 digital books for a quote unquote classroom. It doesn't have to be an actual classroom. Um, there is a paid version available. Um, it's a Google tool. And essentially what it does, let me click on these features here to show you guys. So let's say, for example, that you wanted to create a more accessible version of a storybook, um, or you wanted to create um, a social story, you wanted to, or, or the kids, you know, wanted to write a book with you about, um, you know, when, when the science, again, when the science center came to, uh, came to visit our library last week, let's write a book about it. Um, so it's got all these different fonts you can choose from. You can add images from the internet or take your own photos. It can be a very multimedia book. So there's um, videos and music, or you can record your voice, um, all these different icons. And I love that it's free um, up to 40 books. So if you really needed more than 40 books, you could either pay for an account or you could recycle some of your old ones because you can have up to 40 at a time. But you can see these are some, there's um, templates for those of you that aren't um, graphic artists like myself. I'm not a, I'm saying I'm not a graphic artist at all. I don't have any graphic design skills at all. So, um, but you can guys can just kind of see down here. There's a lot of really, really cool features in here. It's a lot of fun to play with. Um, and I really do encourage you to check it out. Okay, so you can see here they're drawing. So you guys could really make this very much your own with, um, so let's say that you don't have an ebook version of a story that you'd like to, to read to your students, you could create one. You could make comic strips. So again, you could have a whole library of up to 40 books. It can read it to you. And, and you can even some, publish it on your website. Do you have some free books for you to? Yes. Uh, samples too, so that you can, you can see them what they're like. Um, and as expected, their accessibility features are top notch and they're built right into there. So I, um, it's also available on the iPad as well. So I do definitely encourage you to take a look. All right, so Book Creator is a lot of fun. So again, um, this, this uh, title up here is a clickable link. So when Ashley and Kim send out this um, slide deck, that link will be there for you and um, embedded right in. We always try to embed all of our links in so that people don't have to rush to write things down before we go to the next slide, because I know that's a pain. And Kim, do you have a question? No, I went, the doorbell buzzed. I had to go run and job. But no, this all sounds great. So I'm going to open up the UDL Cast Book Builder. And this is by the same people that did the, the checkpoints that we were showing you guys. Go ahead, Samita, I'll log in. And they were, they were, were a lot of books. So these books are all free and accessible. There's thousands of books that are available to yourself. And, and if you publish one, you know, I use the term publish lightly, but mm -hmm. if you share one, then anybody can use it as well. So you see, they've got thousands of books of mm -hmm. different languages. This one. Let me make sure you guys can still see my screen because I realize you can't see the that just popped up. Here we go. So you should be seeing Gus's Rainforest Adventure. Yes. And this is an accessible version of a book. So here's what you'll see. You will see um, that I can read the, uh, or I can have the book read to me. It should be. Gus's Rainforest Adventure. View glossary print view. Previous page. So it's also reading aloud the, and this is for somebody who might be visually impaired. It's also reading out loud the buttons and things like that. Um, down here, you'll see some characters that will help you with the story. So Pedro says, let's look at the picture and talk about how the rainforest is different from where you live. I don't think we really have any rainforest in the United States and certainly not in Connecticut. So the kids might not be as familiar with that. Tell me how the things in the picture are different from your home. Um, and Monty um, is talking about, tell me what you see, tell me what you hear, that kind of thing. I love the Terry's tips on the side. So it gives some tips about how to talk about the book. And then if I go, so the nice and thing is got, not. What I like about it, it's got the, the extension activities, right? So you, you have some activity for kids who are more advanced. You might get bored with what you are doing. You can give them some of the extension activities. 
And so, like I said, there's thousands of books available, but you can, of course, create your Jen, own. Can you pick on the word rainforest? Yeah. Let oh, me reshare. It, it, no, it did. It just it's just the way my screen is sharing it. So here's the here's the glossary that shows up. So it shows you what what it looks like. It mm -hmm. gives you an image of the bird. And then so like so like we said, there's thousands of books that are available in Spanish too, um, but you can also create your own. <clears throat> okay, so oh, I'm gonna reshare. Hold on one second. Okay, get rid of this. No, nope. come on, Claire. Reshare here. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. So that's the UDL Book Builder, and that's by the same organization that does the UDL checkpoints. You will need to create an account for this, right? Yeah, you, but it's free. It's free. But you just need to create an account to log in and to read the books. So you can, you know, you can add this on the screen in your library, read one of the books on the screen, and sure, if kids don't know the meaning of the word, you show the, the picture of the word, and you can add them to the extension question. This would be a great session for a group, small group of kids. And they've got books at different levels, different languages. Yeah, I know. I remember, for example, there's um, a popular one there, the Bad Case of A Bad Case of Stripes. You guys are probably familiar with that book. Yeah, that one's on there as an accessible book. So there's a lot of trade books there as well as as books that were created by other people, non-publishers, I should say. All right, we have some educational websites for you all. So I, I'm not going to click on all these because I know that you're familiar with Overdrive and Hoopla. Um, I'm fairly confident that most of you are familiar with Epic. Is that true? Yeah, I feel like that's one that gets used quite often. So free with a teacher account. I'll tell you guys, I'm not a public school teacher anymore, but I was able to create an account for free. So, um, <laughs> uh, storyline online. So this is books read by professional actors. All right, so Are there's you, lots of different options here. Can you click on a book, please, Claire? Mm -hmm. Let's do the rainbow fish. Love the rainbow fish. This is one of my niece's favorites. Oops. Hello, and welcome to Storyline Online, brought to you by the Screen Actors Guild Foundation. My name is Ernest Borgnine, and we're going to be reading a book today called The Rainbow Fish by Marcus Pfister. Right. So I could see, for example, if you have your own copies of the book, I could see, you know, having these available to the kids. I could see you creating maybe a little, um, like a book creator book or a UDL book, and I could see, you know, let's build some background knowledge. So have you ever felt... Um, Oh, Betty White, I miss her. Um, <laughs> I know, look at, look at her there. Um, <laughs> have you, you know, have you ever felt like you didn't have any friends or that you couldn't join in? You know, like, so just building up that background knowledge for the kids and, you know, what do you do if somebody asks you to share something and you really don't want to share it? You know, like, like really, really just building that up in your head and making it so much more than just a story, but also talking about the social aspect of it, right? So something that kids can, because the rainbow fish, I feel like is a really relatable story. Um, and you could even go deeper into it if you wanted to do some science stuff. You could talk about um, rain, uh, fish and their scales. You could talk about all kinds of things, where they live. You could really get very um, extent, have a lot of fun extension activities with this. So they also have a teacher's guide over there to mm -hmm. guide you through some of the questions that you might have. Yeah. So they really have done a lot of the work for you guys, because I know you don't have a lot of free time to just sit around and create these. Um, but I just see that this could be something really, really engaging for kids. It's a, it's a, it's a very sweet book. You know, I think it's, it's one of the classics. All right. So there's one option. Um, and Story Nori is, as it says, audiobooks read by professional actors. There's Little Fingers. This one is free as well. And so there's games, there's videos and all kinds of things. Um, that the kids can work with. There's coloring pages you could print out, again, for an extension activity. Um, you can click on the opposites one, I guess. So here's a game that the kids can play. And these are all just things that I would use Hello. to help build out background knowledge, right? Yeah. 
So it's just, it's just cute. It's just cute stuff, but I think it's really a great way to really build that. Um, God, he's taking forever to build that, <laughs> um, to build that, that background knowledge for the kids, to build a vocabulary for the kids. Anything so that you can do. If you have a smart board, if you've been interactive smart board in your library, yeah. this would be a really good activity for kids to do while re reading the story, right? Mm -hmm. so making it more interactive for the kids. So just, uh, just some examples here. There's not a ton of books on this site, but I could see these being really good for littles. All right. So those are some options. And like I said, all these links are clickable. So when you get the um, slides, you'll be able to click on these. And these are some educational apps. So again, um, we do encourage you to reach out to us if you would like to, or reach out to our librarian, our, co our librarian colleagues at CERC if you'd like to view any of these for yourself. Um, Adobe Spark Video is one that we use with students when they wanna create or narrate their own stories. Um, so it's basically, it's just a very simple video, app, video editing app that you could use, for example, to you could have pictures of your community, you could have pictures of the library of the kids there, and you could be, it's just another way to create a multimedia book. Okay, so these are just some, um, some options for other, again, educational apps, um, extensions, things like that. We do have all these in our, in our library. Mm -hmm. So if you want to borrow any of them, you can either contact Claire or myself or a librarian. We will guide you to the to which iPad has them. Yeah, because I know, I know um, you guys might want to check them out first and then maybe decide if you'd like to write a grant to purchase a subscription for these. Oh, luckily, none of these are too, too pricey in, in context here. Here's some continued ones. So we've got YouTube Kids. Um, I'll make sure those links are correct. See, this is why we don't send out the, the PowerPoint beforehand because um, we want to make sure sometimes there's things missing. So I'm, I just added that to my little sticky note there. So we'll make sure that I put, I'll put the links in for Khan Academy Kids and Sesame Street and all those um, ones. So again, if you're doing a social emotional you know, topic in a book, you know, you could whip out the Sesame Street app and you guys could practice some mindful breathing. You could practice some um, reflection exercise, all kinds of, all, all kinds of really great um, activities with the littles. These are some high interest, low level texts. So I talked before a little bit about how it can be challenging um, for kids that are still, that are struggling to read or are still learning to read. Um, it can be more challenging to find books for them that they can access on their own um, without making it too babyish, right? Um, so here are some options here. And then um, our librarian, Elizabeth, put together some great uh, lists of publishers in that link below as well. So um, what we mean by a decodable book, just so you all know, a decodable book is a book that is 95% plus um, decodable, meaning that all of the words typically follow um, our phonics rules in the English language. Um, they will still contain what are called um, sight words or heart words, words, words that have to be learned, but they'll be very high frequency words for the kids. It'll be very predictable. Um, so there are some, there are high noon books in particular has a ton of options. The Toucan series is, you'll see it's, it's a much more limited set, but I did want to, um, I did want to highlight that one. And then, so we'll talk about um, more story time. So one of the, some of the, the tips, and we have, we have a lot of tips built in. So um, we think that it's great if you can provide additional copies of the book for the students so that they can hold it in their hands too, um, if possible, or, or you can also use a doc cam or a projector for the kids to better see and interact with the text. Um, that link there is a Sounds Abound storybook activities. So I've talked a little bit about um, phonological awareness and phonological and phonemic awareness is the base for which every person learns to read. If you do not have the ability to manipulate sounds of our language, then you will not have the ability to read successfully. Um, and so those are some, it's, it, I think it's over a hundred pages. It's a scripted, um, activity packet that requires almost no prep on your end. It's free to access and download. Um, and I just provided that in case that is something that you would like to do. So for example, if you are reading a book about a raccoon and you wanna work on um, activities with the letter R, that would be a great resource for you to do so. 
Um, another thing that we recommend is using those physical objects or pictures to kind of help you bring the story to life. Um, in our library, we have a couple of, um, what did you call them? Like, like the brown bear kit? Yeah. The brown bear kit, the good night moon, and you've got, uh, yeah, those are the two we have. Yeah. So basically what I'm talking about is either having pictures or um, little manipulatives, things that will help you bring the story to life for the kids. Um, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. You could just print out some pictures on cardstock or you could grab them off Google. Just something that the kids can kind of see um, how the story progresses mm -hmm. with um, visual representations of characters and objects in the book. Um, and again, we always recommend that they pair with audio text because then you can say to the caregivers, Hey, if you want to, you know, enjoy the story again tomorrow, you can go on to Overdrive or Hoopla or whatever, and, and here's where you can find um, to listen to the story again and again. And, and I think it's really know. important for you to give some <laughs> tips to the parents as well, mm -hmm. so then they can engage the kids at home too, right? Which story time uh, doesn't happen once a week when they come to you. It's a thing that it should be continuous and happening all the time. Some parents may not be aware of some of the tips. It would be great to share them with the families as well. <clears throat> so again, here's an example of how you could support reading with visuals. And it doesn't have to look like this. It could be pictures off the internet. It could be, if you were so inclined, you could draw pictures. But just um, this is <clears throat> one way that you could support reading with those visuals. So these pictures are from the software called board maker. Mm -hmm. I know it's expensive, but they're really good for some kids. Yeah, but you don't have to use this. You could um, mm -hmm. just Google, for example, the ASL sign for more, and you could do it that way too. You don't, you absolutely don't have to be purchasing more software. No. <clears throat> but again, if you're show, if you're reading about, you know, the character wanted more ice cream or something, and you could be doing this, right? More. You know, so you could be showing visually and physically what does that look like. We are not recommending that you buy what we are, but we, we just want you to be aware of the options that are out there. Yeah, and just to have you really see what the reading with visuals looks like. So some, oh, and um, then right oh, to the right there, that's a picture of one of the sets that we have in our in our library. So that's the little brown bear, brown bear kit that you could borrow. Um, they make a lot of them for a lot of different stories, but you don't have to spend the money for that. If you had, you know, a story about animals and you had a little set of plastic animals, you could use that or you could find, again, I even used to just print out um, some pictures on cardstock and just hand them and hand them around to the kids. So it's not 3D, but it's still something where it's that visual representation that they can hold in their hands. And I as much just as wanna jump in and say, I hope at least Two of you know where you can get these. If thank you, Chrissy, I see the thumbs up for the mm -hmm. love. Of, we have, I'm looking at them. I am <laughs> looking at what we have in the service center, including more than one brown bear, brown bear. I think three or four rainbow fish. Um, so these are available to borrow as well. But I know like I had a lot of fun making them in my downtime at the actual desk, which was also a treat for kids and caretakers who would then show up at story time and see them. Um, but yeah, you don't have to spend money on these things unless you have the money to spend, I think, between SARC, between the service center and between Google um, and like a laminator um, so that it doesn't get like crunched up at little hands. Um, these things are available. But yeah, when we were talking about this, I was like, if someone doesn't know that these exist at the service center, I need to do my job a lot better. <laughs> so then um, some other things that we want to make sure we include when we're talking about accessibility. Um, do you have a range of topics and complexities with your text? Do you have visual diversity with your characters? And do you find that your patrons are well represented in those books? Um, and so here's an example, like if I'm following along the text using my hands, not a kid's book, but you know, I'm like, Oh, G is the only single letter phonogram which spells this, you know, <laughs> I'm reading Uncovering the Logic of English, so not a kid's book. But, um, but again, just really being very expressive. And I know as librarians, you guys are already really good at that, pointing to those objects and pictures and ask the children, what, what do you see there? What, what, what object is that? And if you have a visual representation mm -hmm. that they can hold, even better. And I you think can it's also really use those animations or the video clips. And I think it's really important 
to have diverse books in your collection. So this is mm -hmm. representative of your community. So, you know, do you have books around different races, different kinds of people, different, you know, I know that there's been a lot of talk about banning books and stuff like that. I hope you, in your libraries, you have this variety of books that kids can see themselves, mm -hmm. right? You can know what different holidays are on the calendar. So I know Ramadan is coming up. You can have a story about Ramadan and what that entails for, for people that observe that holiday. So just, you know, being aware of who lives in your community, right? And who celebrates what holidays. And you can ask the kids too, you know, what's special in your home or your family. So again, just even more tips here. And this is why we send out the slide deck. Um, having a book walk to kind of preview the book and talk about here's what we're going to, it helps kids prep, right? And to be engaged in the story. Some kids get really nervous if they don't know what's happening or if or they don't know what to expect. And so you can talk about just really quick going through, we're going to talk about, you're going to see that the character does this and you're going to see that the character does this, right? You don't want spoilers, but like, you're just going to, you're going to show what to, what they can expect in the book. Um, Again, having multiple copies of the book so children can follow along is so great. It gives us that early print awareness because in the beginning, if, you're, if you've ever read to a tiny baby, they have no clue what the difference between the picture and the text is. They don't know that a book starts on, starts, you know, that we read text from left to right. That we, they don't know that books have a beginning, middle, and end. We teach them that through that print awareness. Um, another thing that um, Smita and I put in here that was, it's really brilliant too. Um, if kids are holding the books themselves or you're having the kids turn the pages, putting clothespins on the books can be really helpful for little hands because it's hard for them. Sometimes those pages are slippery and it's easier for them to grasp the page that way. So just write that and then you can reuse them on your books. Um, kids do really well with those repetitive and predictable texts. So again, just making your voice really engaging and um, you may have children there that um, either because they're sitting in the back or because they have visual impairment of some type, they may have trouble seeing, seeing the illustrations. And so if you're describing what you're seeing on the page, that's really helpful for them. Again, explaining those concepts and vocabulary before and during reading. And again, using those animated facial expressions, even if you look a little bit silly, the kids love it. And you guys know that. Samina, is there anything I forgot on this page? No. Okay, all right, good, we're doing good on time. So we have a ton more resources here. Um, I'll talk about this one briefly because this is kind of a pet project of mine to bring to Connecticut. Um, we're still working on that, uh, Kim and Ashley. Haven't gotten that grant yet, but we're working on it. Um, <laughs> there's two programs here that I wanna highlight. One is the Road to Decode program. Um, and that's a program that is catered towards public librarians such as yourself. They're a nonprofit. They are based in New York. Um, we don't have any uh, of them in Connecticut right now, but again, I'm working very hard on bringing that. Um, but they do have a lot of great resources on their website talking about um, explaining the science of reading research better to librarians who aren't necessarily going to be instructing in reading, but still who are reading to, to patrons. Um, and they also provide an additional list of publishers for decodable books that would be great to have at your library. Um, there's library partners on that list so that you could you can contact those other libraries and, and you could go visit them if you wanted to or talk to those other librarians. Um, and Reading Color is um, an additional program that they have under their larger umbrella. And um, that is uh, resources to support um, and to find uh, diverse books and culturally responsive books. Okay, <clears throat> and then down there, there is that LibGuide um, that's published by CERC, um, catered, catering towards specifically towards librarians such as yourself to understand learning disabilities and dyslexia a little bit better. <clears throat> and again, these are all clickable links. Here are some more, some uh, more links. The first one is, we use AT to, for infants and toddlers. This is a research paper out of University of Tennessee, I think. And they've got a lot of research. Can you go down a little bit to the next page? See, they've got, this book is in a binder, right? For kids who have 
gross motor functions. Can you go to the page four? Mm -hmm. Next page. Oh, page four. I'm sorry. You said you said page four, didn't you? This is so good. Did Let me you make it bigger so you guys can see. They use blocks to for story time. Right? And they do so it's for story time that you can manipulate them and play with these blocks and participate in story time. Some of some of our kids with more physical impairment or with you know with intellectual impairment, they might use these blocks to interact with you in story time. This is a really great resource and they've got a lot of how to make story time more interactive and more, more feasible uh, more feasible when they for kids, more accessible for kids. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I just think this is such a cute idea, right? And it's so, it would be so easy to put these together, right? It's not something you have to go out and purchase. Uh, well, and I was even kids, thinking yeah. if you have slightly older kids, I know we would do like, like PJ story time for sort of six mm -hmm. to eight year olds. Like you could separate them, like have a, the word 100%. dog on one Lego and a picture of a dog and another Lego and they put yeah. them together. All of you have to do this on my behalf because now my job is boring. Oh, I've got this is recorded. <laughs> I love my job. I do. I just miss story time sometimes, sometimes, not all the times. No, I love it. I mean, you could also, for older kids, if they don't like the Duplos, you could use magnetiles. You could use pretty much anything, right? Yeah, that would be another fun one. So um, I love these tips in here. I think they're, they're phenomenal. Um, and you could, like Kim said, you could, you could be matching pictures and words. You could be um, matching categories of things. So if you're learning about like healthy eating, they could be matching all of the vegetables and fruits together. I don't know. I'm just making this up. But, and also um, when you mentioned different language, right? Mm -hmm. I really like that tip. So it can be of two languages, English and another language. Exactly. They're, they're reading the, they're getting the comprehension too. Exactly. And, and the picture. So these are some really good tips. We also talk about um, building a social story. So when, you know, just like anybody, regardless of whether or not the ch child has a disability, at some point they're going to be brand new to your library. And so um, what's really helpful is for your littles, maybe, I don't know if any of you guys do story time for kids as young as two or three but they all need to be taught, what does it look like when I come in, when I sit at story time? How do I check out a book? How do I browse a book? You could create a social, it's called a social story. Um, you could create a short story about what that looks like. And you could put in pictures of your circulation desk and of your, of your children's area that they browse and all these different things. And the, the kids start to understand what are the expectations for when they come in, you know, treating the books nicely and not you know, mm -hmm. ripping them up and, and not throwing them, you know, that kind of thing, <laughs> whatever is important to, to, to you at your library. And Claire, can you go to the, the page six, please? Sure. So I really like the slant board too, right? Mm -hmm. For somebody who's not able to hold the book, you just put the book on the slant board and they can turn the pages. Right, because you might not have like a large version of that book, but that would be also a really great option. And then the page turner that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. So you could use yeah. those um, clips. You could use, these are pom-poms. Yeah. Binders. Mm -hmm. Right? So we have a Big if Mac, I... don't we, Sina? Sorry? Do we have a Big Mac, this blue button down here? Yes. Yeah. We have a Big Mac in our office. Not the burger. Um, but... I really was like, what? <laughs> it's completely different. And the Big Mac is a communication, is a one missed communication device. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was, if a story had a, had a repetitive line, like, you know, clap, clap, and then you can record it, and every time the clap, clap comes, the child can press it and child can participate. Right. I, I think these are, this is such a cool, cool newsletter um, to have. You could sign yes. up for it too, I'm sure. Well, and I remember when we were kind of talking about this, Claire and Samita, just sort of when taking into consideration the sentence, it got this all started that, you know, 
having having sort of like a sensory story time is great, but all story time should be accessible for all kids. And it could be something as simple as taking clothespins and leaving them on a table so that when it's time to go through the book, the caretakers who know that they need those or know that they exist can just grab them and go. And you don't have to do this, this huge hullabaloo. Um, you know, the all of the resources are out there that people can take if they need, leave if they don't, or take if they want to use them. Um, and a every story time can become accessible and we're not sort of limiting certain kids to the one Saturday a month where you do a sensory story time for something like exactly. that. Exactly. Exactly. Cause that's not how the real world works, right? Is that, is that if I ran a business or if I'm in a school, anybody with any kind of need can walk in there at any time. And I, and I want to make sure that, um, what I have is accessible to them. All right, and then we, again, we have a number of LibGuides here. I'll click on this link too. Have you all heard of squishy books? So AAC stands for Augmentative Alternative Communication, just so you guys know. This mean, I'll let you talk about the squishy books. I'll make the screen bigger so you can see. Squishy books are, are books with, you know, Ziploc bags that you put in stuff, right? So you can, if it's a book about food, you put different food items and zip lock it. If it's a book about leaves, you can put different kinds of leaves. So these cushy books are really good and and they'll be fun for all kids. Can I, can I ask Smita, is there like a physical, y'all, I'm doing all the talking, like I do story times, I'm just so fascinated, and I, I, Krista, you're the only other person I can see on my screen, I'm like, thank God she's leaning forward too, because I feel like, uh, like a goober, is there, is there an actual book that goes along with this, or are like the things in the Ziploc bags kind of like following what the story would be? It's following what the story would be. Oh. You can create your own story too. Hmm? So here's how to create a squishy book. So here's some more examples. Oh, and it's stapled together. Oh, together. someone yeah, so do this and invite me to consult. I'm the consultant. Someone do this and specifically invite me to consult mm -hmm. and save me some Cheerios, please. But like, I love this, right? Like each page for, for learning how to grow plants. That's so oh. cool, right? It's so, it's so interactive. You could really do a lot with this. You feel, feel so I mean, shafted. Clarence, you know, where <laughs> were you guys like six years ago? This would have been here's amazing a, to do on like the bookmobile. Oh, like here's the you beach see, book. How, how cute is book. that, right? I and love it. So simple and easy to make, right? Mm -hmm. They're not expensive. Right? It's I love it. And if it's something that's not going to make a mess, like I wouldn't do the sand and let the kids, but like if it's just objects, you know, you could, of course, let the kids open up the the, the bags and play with them. Um, just, you know, maybe you want to be careful about things like the the kinetic sand or the squishy, whatever you, th those you probably want to keep duct taped up so you're not trying to vacuum um, Play-Doh out of the carpet. Because remember, play and reading, they go together, mm -hmm. right? So I really like this website, and this is one of my favorite things to show to teachers when I'm working with early, early educators. So Victoria just had a great idea. There could be a program night to have caregivers customize books for their little ones. That is amazing. Yeah. I love that idea. Oh, and Michelle says- and You need someone friends. from the state to be a consultant, right? <laughs> you need- <laughs> You oh, Michelle, to. you're going to do some. Yeah. You know what, guys? If you do any of these, do me a favor. Take some pictures and tweet at CERC. We want to see. Or email them to us. But either way, we really want to see. So, again, just some really amazing extension activities and just ways to make these accessible. And, again, even if you don't expect anybody who has these needs, I mean, I would use these with any kids. You know, there's absolutely no reason why you why you couldn't. And these are just they fun, all love these. engaging, right? Remember, mm -hmm. we talked about the UDL and engagement. This would really engage them to reading. They'd love it. And it just right? it just provides that, because, you know, it, it, you might have kids that, will, that have never gone to the beach or don't know what the beach is. You might have kids that haven't gone to the zoo or experienced these. And so this is a way to kind of give that representation. 
All right, so those are some other LibGuides there, those links in the middle. Just watching the time here. Um, I won't, these are just um, titles that I like. Um, if you wanna have these in your library books for parents about dyslexia, these are some great titles to have. Um, my personal favorite is um, either The Gift of Dyslexia or The Dyslexic Advantage. If you were gonna buy any books on the list, that's the two I would prioritize um, because it really shows dyslexia in a very positive light. Um, it's something where, where I, can, I personally consider it a superpower. Um, the, the, I, the International Dyslexia Association estimates that, um, and, and estimates do vary depending on who you talk to, but we estimate that anywhere from 10 to 20% of the global population has dyslexia. So it's not something that's um, uncommon. And I think that it makes a lot of sense to kind of reframe this something as this is just a different way that our brains learn. And a lot of the times, like I said, people with dyslexia, Richard Branson is dyslexic. Uh, my mind is blanking. Uh, Cher is dyslexic. Uh, Tom Cruise is dyslexic. There's a lot of people out there that are dyslexic, but also extremely successful. Um, and so I like framing it in a very positive uh, light. And then here are some more dyslexia books for kids. That would be really fun. My personal favorite, I bet I'm sure a lot of you know P Patricia Polacco. She's dyslexic. Thank you, Mr. Falker. Always makes me cry. That's a, that's a great um, children's book about having dyslexia. There are some articles and research it here if you're interested in learning more, but we're also available by email or to meet with you if you have additional questions. These are just some, some research articles that you might be interested in. We would love for you to ask us some questions and you know how this would help you with your patrons if you could tell us how it would help you with your patrons and ask us some questions. Or if you don't have questions, um, I put a QR code there and I also have, um, I also have dropped that link in the chat. We love to hear your feedback and let us know um, what other uh, resources you could use or you know if what things that we could be doing better, what things you liked. If you would be so kind as to leave us some feedback using that link, um, it'll take you just about three minutes of your time unless you have a lot to say. Yes, Sue. Please. Yeah. Please unmute yourself. I unmute myself. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, you didn't mention flannel boards at all. I use flannel boards quite often. Like when we're you're talking about um, brown bear and brown, and I might read the book and then afterwards use my flannel yes. And you know, it, do the story right exactly right after it with the flannel board. Um, I agree with you. We missed that. We we forgot about that. You know what, um, Kim or Ashley? Sorry. Um, if if people want, if they just want to fill out the um, the state library one, I'm not going to make you do both. So if you want to just fill out the state library eval, and then they can share the feedback with us. That's fine. I'm not going to make you do two. So yes. feel free to just do the one that Ashley put in there. That's fine. Thank you, Sue, for that. We forgot about that, I think, the plan and work. We use it all the time. And also, hi, Michelle, because I live in South Windsor. I'm down the street. <laughs> Anybody else has any comments? Yeah. Were there any other questions? And, and just to sort of reiterate, you all know that I always like beg you to fill out the survey, but what I can say is that the State Library has a really good relationship with CERC. We're talking to someone from CERC like every week, sometimes just we're back on like yeah, like just sort of because, um, so this is, we, we sort of plant, like I said, this one program sort of grew from a sentence, um, but we, as with our GELS series, which is sort of also with relationships that we have with other state institutions, this will not be the first time um, that we bring and bring this will not be the last time that we bring CERC in. So the more information you give us about, um, any additional ways we can help you grow equitable library services? Man, actually, we couldn't have picked that name any better if we tried. Um, please let us know. Be very, you know, clear and concise. We we want to make sure that you all um, get what you need. And I, I agree with Ashley. I think UDL might be next because I know that I don't know anything about that. Um, and I don't do story times anymore. But um, I would definitely love to love to learn more. But did anyone have any other questions or 
um, situations we, or something within your space? Can we could do them on UDL in the libraries. Please. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, y'all, you know, we'll be calling you or emailing you in like, I don't know. Well, I'm trying to, I'm, soon. I'm looking at, there's no watch on this hand. Soon. <laughs> um, because I know that I wanted to learn more about that. And this will go really well with, if anyone's seen the advertisements we have for reimagining school readiness training that's coming up, these two things partner together really well. I'm learning um, as I sort of sit through here. So there's a lot of scaffolding that's happening right now between information that's sort of available for folks. Um, oh, you leaving, Michelle? Bye, Michelle. Oh, we've got a question in the chat. Any suggestions? For, oh, okay, good. I you read will it. add some. Yes, we have so many. We, yes, physical space more inclusive. Absolutely. Yes, we have a whole checklist for that. Yes. Yeah, oh. So, so what I'll do is I'll work on this um, today, and to, or probably more like tomorrow. And Smita and I will work on it. And I will say I'm going to put a deadline for myself by Tuesday. We're going to send out these slide decks to Kim and Ashley so that they can distribute it to you all. So hang tight for that. Um, the energy saver, like, yeah. So, um, so we will we will definitely include some of that. That's a that's a great thing that that we should have in there. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, you guys. You're you're awesome. So we're all gonna get together to make squishy books. Yes. Yeah. No, that's cool. Yes. Great. Great. That looked like a lot of fun. And Michelle, I'll stop in and say hi soon. I'm the one that used to always book. Uh, private rooms for my, for my, because when I was tutoring back then, I used to always do that. I don't know if you were there at the time, but I'll come in and say hi. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here today. And um, you can look up the, for the recording and, and um, it was really nice to meet you guys. Yeah. Thank you. We'll email all that out as soon as we have it. Again, really fill out the survey, not for us, but for you. So we <laughs> can better meet your needs. Thanks, folks. It's almost Friday. Thank God. Thank you very much for your. Bye, guys. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank Have you. a good rest of your day.